official uh, when you hear the camera go click, click, click. It's just like <laughs> Victoria's Secret fashion. <laughs> Do you know We got everybody seated and uh, started. You yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce the groups and then we'll get going. But that's everybody sit down. <laughs> Time to start. Oh, come on. Okay. <laughs> now you're ready, member. All right. Well, I was just gonna keep milling around. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, grab a seat and and we'll get going with the uh, the next panel. Uh, this panel is going to look at solar thermal technologies, uh, and we cover a, a, a wide range um, here. Um, we're going to have uh, a panel that consists of uh, first uh, Professor um, Alex Slocum, whom, whom you just met. Uh, he's, he's the retiring shy one on, on the panel. Uh, Alex is the Papillardo Professor of Mechanical Engineering and a McVicker uh, Faculty uh, Teaching Fellow. Um, he's a great inventor. Uh, Twelve of his products have received um, um, R&D 100 awards. Um, it's always great to have Alex um, up here, and, and uh, so Alex will hear from you on concentrated solar power and other things. Okay, you want me to start, or are you going yes, to go Yes, go ahead. Okay. So I've got ten minutes, so all these slides will be on online, and uh, let's just dive right in, assuming I get this thing to work. So the first thing is, you got to ask yourself, what, what resources do you have and what would you do with them? And this is something I wrote back to my representatives way back, uh, right after 9-11, because I was uh, actually in the Middle East at the time. And uh, what would you do with $2 trillion? If we would have taken the $2 trillion we spent blowing everything up back then, we could have had over 500 gigawatts, 24-7 renewable energy, 500 gigawatts, half of the US domestic supply, OK? So if you look at history in the past going forward, there's another $2 trillion that's going to get spent over the next 10 years blowing more shit up. So what do you want to do with that $2 trillion? Okay, so when people say, it's too expensive, uh, they're full of it. You just, what, how do you spend it? Okay, and whoa, forward. So the, the thing is, we've got to find the, the disruptive technologies. How are you going to find them? And, and I, I hypothesize that, and I'll show you how we did came to this that uh, symbiotic relationships are what create the tipping points. And you've got to start way back in kindergarten, working all the way up through you know, 12. How do you get people starting engaged to do stuff? And in the process of doing what we know how, humans are going to find problems with it. And remember, one over problem equals opportunity. So that, I think, is the groundwork for how we're going to solve all our problems. Not all of us just sitting down and saying, think, we are solving problems. What, how do we solve? No, 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 no. Trust serendipity and symbiotic relations. We'll give you uh, some examples of those. And remember, all this stuff is, is online. The next thing you've got to remember is reciprocity. Whenever you think you're happy, try the opposite. Whenever you're sad, do the opposite. Think about China. How did they grow in the last 10, 20 years from absolutely nothing to a world economic power? Well, until last week. Um, so if you want to take re natural resources, don't just take them. You got to invest back in how to use them, and uh, this this ties into consumers as producers. Why doesn't everybody have a solar hot water heater on their roof? You're like, well, they're ugly. Well, I didn't know they work. So how are you going to solve that problem? Because remember, solar thermal hot water is the simplest, best thing you can possibly do. I have it in New Hampshire. Three years we paid back the entire system, and we have teenagers in the house. We had so the, it, it, weaving all that together. A few years ago, I started looking at solar thermal. And uh, I spent a lot of time in Spain and in California touring plants, talking to plant operators, not the VPs of research. No offense, but you guys, you wear ties. This is a wonderful system. You should invest in our system. It is wonderful. Did I tell you how wonderful it is? Everything works perfectly. Yes, it's a wonderful system. Where you talk to the operators, ah, the thing leaks. And let me show you this valve. Do you got a solution for this valve? That's the person you got to hunt down. And what I found is, is with solar thermal, the problem is reality. The physicists have screwed up. Because at night, the horses have to rest. They can't be towing the sun across the sky 24-7, right? So the sun stops shining, and what was <gasps> hot and expanded during the day <gasps> shrinks during the night. 
and you get this thermal cycling that if you talk to anybody who runs a steam boiler will tell you you're nuts. You can't. You can't turn it off. So the problem with solar thermal in general is, is the systems aren't used at night. So you just have thermal fatigue killing them. No problem. We're an engineer. We read if you give a mouse a cookie, we'll use stronger steels, more of it. We'll, and you start putting Band-Aids on things, and pretty soon you got a mummy. So you've got to approach the problem from the pain aspect, and one over pain equals opportunity or happiness. What do you do to take sunlight in that doesn't care if it gets sunlight on or off? A liquid. Any solid will expand and break and contract, but a liquid doesn't. So that's the first bit of physics. So this led us to uh, molten salt, which great way to store energy, but molten salt is also transparent. So this is what was born, we called it CS Pond, Concentrated Solar Power On Demand. The acronym works because it's also a pond and it's got CSP in it. See all the little, if you give a mouse a cookie, things we're leading in here. And the moral of the story is, is that instead of beaming uh, sunlight up to a tower full of tubes to get cold at night and then have massive thermal stresses, oops, no problem, we'll just have pumps and thermal heat tape to keep them hot to keep mess. You just uh, beam the light into the salt. Salt absorbs the energy at night. You close the doors and you have no pipes. You just have the hot bath of salt that you can now have constant flow of constant temperature salt through your steam generator for 24-7 power. You, it's enough to think of an idea, but you also got to do the mathematics behind the full-scale modeling of it, which we did. And now this is a, a project we're doing with Mazdar Institute in Abu Dhabi. And uh, we just had a, one of our meetings this morning. The hardware is all coming together. So uh, we'll report on that, I guess, in again another six months or so or next year. So you see how we took a very simple idea, went down and found what are the basic physics which create the problems, thermal expansion, and inverted it by, not by solving thermal expansion by a better alloy or whatever, but by eliminating the problem or finding something that doesn't care. Okay, that, that I think is going to be the key to everything we do is not being clever engineers to solve problems, but by being mellow, laid back dudes. That's why I'm wearing Hawaiian, of course. So like, wow, that's too complicated. It's got to be a simpler way, all right? Because remember, this stuff has got to be cost effective. Another thing, uh, wind, wind energy is great. A lot of the store renewables are great, but how do you store it? So we're doing a lot with pumped hydro. Old idea, people may say it's too expensive, but we're going to show you examples of how if you co-locate things, we think we can drive the cost down, way down. Coming back to here, how, how did we get two birds with one stone here? How did we co-locate things? What's the symbiotic feature here? You want to guess? We took the absorber, which is the molten salt, and also made it the energy storage medium. A giant tank of hot salt can store gigawatt hours of energy. It is also the thing that by itself, when the sunlight goes in and melts the salt, it receives it. You don't need any pumps, any tube. That's how we get the cost way down, and the, not only the cost to make, but the cost to operate. With pumped hydro, people are talking about offshore wind, because I don't want to see wind turbines. I think they're ugly. When I'm way offshore, 40 kilometers offshore, the earth was designed to be of a radius such that if you go one marathon distance offshore, you can't see the turbines. Joke there, you can laugh. <laughs> but if you, so if you anchor your turbines with these spheres that you pump, fill up and ex pump water in and out, you're good for storing energy as a pumped hydro system. Nuclear, big problem, big opportunities. That's why you have to go and give a moose a muffin beyond uh, anything else. We're working a, a, big DOE pro, a big DOE team on how do you harvest uranium from seawater. It's too expensive to do. Ah, but if you've got these offshore towers for your wind turbines, it's a perfect platform to hold the uranium harvesting device, and now you can lower the cost of both. Nuclear, what are you going to do with all the waste? Well, the oil, company, oil companies have a lot of drilling uh, things uh, equipment lying around, so to speak. And uh, deep borehole storage is a fantastic system. It's been around since the 60s. It was never really thought possible until now with horizontal drilling. Fantastic way to solve the waste problem. See, we're using two birds, one stone. Lowering the cost of wind energy, we, we, we look for where the cost is, 
the cost is, is moving about 30% of the cost of a wind turbine is the pole. Not the really cool geeky things of blades and gearboxes and stuff, but just the silly pole. How do you get rid of the cost of the pole? You mathematically look at where is the sensitivity. It's in the diameter is too small and the wall thickness is too thick, so you can get under a bridge. So we designed a machine that you put on site, you bring flat plates to the machine on site, and then now you can spiral well to a tabled pole, use one third less steel, and even go 30% higher. What this enables, for example, if you look at the state of Maine, six gigawatts of energy potential wind currently on the, on the ridges. But if you can go from 80 meters to 120 to 140 meters high, the state of Maine has 60 gigawatts of wind energy potential just by going higher above the trees. So we, you can totally transform the landscape, so to speak, for things. So that's an active company zooming off. We're all, we have an active research project in how you combine wave energy harvesting with those offshore turbine poles. And last but not least, to tie it all together to save California and maybe the rest of the world, something we call the AFRO system. Advanced pumped hydro reverse osmosis. Because it turns out that the optimal height for pumped hydro is 500 meters. That same pressure is the, from 500 meters is what you need to feed into a reverse osmosis system to get fresh water. And we have a paper we're just putting out on that. And uh, we can lower the cost of energy and fresh water. You can get two for one. And the mapping we did, you see these little areas here. Let's see if the, uh, the happy laser works. Aha. So I grew up in LA, so I can say these things. So uh, around here is Malibu. And these mountains here, I ride my bike and hike in and stuff. For the very high parts here, nothing but scrub and coyotes. And it turns out that uh, in, in just a couple of these areas, if I were to build a four kilometer by four kilometer seawater lake, where I drop them down 30 meters each time, I can provide all the energy and fresh water for 10 million people. Another system like this uh, uh, east of San Clemente, another 10 million people. And if the uh, folks in California don't want to damage the scrub, no problem. Because in Tijuana, which is 30 miles south, they even have better mountains. And I bet my Mexican friends will be happy to build an Afro system and then sell the wa fresh water and electricity to uh, the folks up north. And with that, uh, turn it over to Bob. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so before we move on to the next uh, panelist, a uh, quick question. Uh, one of the issues with CSP uh, is the capital intensive nature of that and, and the resulting cost of electricity, more expensive than uh, PV today. C can you say something about how the CS Pond idea might help with capital cost or uh, what the, the cost of electricity you project would be from uh, CS Pond? Okay, so the, 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 the CS pond eliminates the highly complex tower tubing and pumping. So we, we projected about 20 to 30 percent lower cost per kilowatt hour than a traditional concentrated solar power machine. And we won't need any backup gas burners. So the steam turbine can run 24 7 just with the CSP uh, loading. So we think in the end we'll be cost competitive. We could be cost competitive. Um, this is in the five, it depends how you do numbers, five to eight-ish cents per kilowatt hour type level. And you're also dispatchable when you need it. Right. You can also run hotter. And so the, the DOE program, which is now, I think, uh, culminating with GE licensing it, the, uh, the, the supercritical CO2 cycle, which you need much hotter than any normal CSP system can do. You need 650 to 700, and we can give them that. Now you're really lower cost if you get the supercritical CO2 cycle in. Yeah, great. Thank you. So the next, next panelist is uh, Gong Chen. Uh, Gong is uh, the department head in mechanical engineering uh, here at MIT. He's the Carl Soderberg Professor of Power Engineering. Uh, and he's also the director of one of the uh, Department of Energy, uh, Energy Frontier Research Centers. Uh, his center is uh, called Solid State Solar Thermal Energy Conversion. Um, so Gong? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bob. And uh, uh, Alex gave uh, many exciting examples of the innovation, uh, the ideas, and the uh, practice going on at MIT. And this is really what we do best. So I want to uh, follow that trend and give a few examples 
uh, uh, that the, the innovation we're doing uh, in the uh, solar thermal uh, technology domain. And uh, uh, it was uh, uh, mentioned, uh, uh, Alex mentioned the solar hot water. Uh, I, I want to expand this uh, actually uh, uh, story a little bit. And uh, uh, solar hot water, uh, the way that w uh, most widely deployed is in China. And there's over 100 million, this is actually quite a few years ago, uh, the growth rate is about 20 to 30 percent uh, expansion, is over 100 million squares deployed. And uh, the story is that uh, if you look at this, uh, uh, this is uh, all glass uh, solar hot water vacuum tubes. And the inventor I met is a professor in Tsinghua University, and uh, he was a vacuum electronics guy. And uh, during Chen Cultural Revolution, he was sent to countryside, and he came back, and the vacuum tubes were gone. So that's, uh, he turned his attention uh, to the uh, solar thermal application and really changed many people's life, uh, including those days. If I go back to my parents, uh, I would use solar hot water uh, in, the, in the house. So I, I, I use this example as really uh, uh, say that we need uh, uh, ideas, innovations uh, in the solar thermal uh, technology area. And uh, let me pick uh, the current example in practice, and this is a, a receiver, a vacuum receiver uh, that's in, used in all the trough. This, if you look at the trough, those are the, receiver, uh, the receiving tube. And uh, uh, to, uh, you collect uh, all the sunlight, you focus to the tube, and you heat it up, and inside you have fluid flow. And here, what's important is you do not want to lose the heat, right? So if you think about the heat losing mechanism, sorry, I have a little bit of equation here, one is uh, radiation loss. And uh, when the surface is hot, it's uh, proportional to temperature force power. That's the radiation loss. And the other is a convection loss. And uh, if, if you do not evacuate it, uh, you have convection, and that's a big heat loss. So uh, in the solar hot water system, in the solar concentrated solar uh, uh, trough system, uh, what we do here is using vacuum. So we evacuate it, so you eliminate the convection loss. And then uh, you will uh, put the coatings here to reduce the radiation loss. This is the so-called emittance, which uh, I, I think Marion uh, will talk a lot. And uh, so those are the uh, key labelers uh, for the solar hot water system. And uh, if you further uh, want to reduce it, you increase concentration, right? You concentrate so that you have less area to uh, read it. And uh, so uh, what I'm going to do next is rather than doing this way, I'm going to think about how I can reduce the temperature of the emitting surface while still maintain the hot water or the steam, the oil. Because in the current technology, it's about 400 oil flowing through the, 400 degrees Celsius flowing through the, uh, the pipe. And, uh, so we founded by uh, uh, RPA-E project where we are looking to put in uh, aerogel, which is uh, a transparent, this is, a, this is just a, not actually not the best example. We have much more clear transpar transparent aerogels. Uh, but, but what you can see, uh, say, what we he use here is a, it's a very thermally insulating. It's basically a nanometer glass uh, with a very high porosity uh, and you, have, you can get a transparency uh, up to uh, 98, uh, 99%. And uh, so we put this in front of the uh, uh, collector, the tube, where you flew hot fluids. And in this case, the internal is hot, but when the uh, heat conducts out, uh, the temperature gradually reduces. So effectively, the emitting surface temperature is much lower. And in this case, we can do it without a vacuum and we can use just a black surface and to achieve comparable efficiency as used in the state of R. And uh, uh, more importantly, also allow us, uh, is this is a design is compatible with uh, linear Fresnel uh, reflectors uh, that has a lower cost. So the cost model we have here uh, uh, so far is we could, this, this could lead to a 30% cost reduction compared to what's uh, used in the, in the uh, uh, practice. And by the way, I, we're, we're looking for people uh, in the commercialization side who are very much interested in partnership, and uh, this is the RPA-E 
project we want to uh, translate to the uh, real world. So this is one example. And uh, let me give another example. This is a, 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 re a related to our DOE Energy Frontier Research Center where we are using solid state device. And in this case, uh, 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 semiconductors, N-type, P-type semiconductors. And essentially, uh, some of the, you probably heard about thermocouples. These are thermocouples. And if one side of, the, uh, of this is hot, the diffusion of the charge go from the hot side to the cold side and drive the current flow. And uh, this is a, a actually a device, a millimeter uh, thick device sandwiched between a hot and the cold side, and you can say uh, uh, it generated power. So uh, thermal, solar thermoelectric energy conversion actually is not a new idea. The first patent uh, was uh, 1888, and the first demonstration was in the 1950s. So that's about the same time as uh, the uh, photovoltaic. But the efficiency is only 0.6% and never had any progress. And uh, so uh, the first demonstration we did uh, was uh, taking the vacuum tube idea in solar hot water. And uh, uh, so here is an absorber. This is an absorber that's uh, used in typical solar hot water system. And now here is the thermoelectrics. These are uh, very small. You can say uh, the absorber ratio and the uh, thermoelectric element ratio is about 300 to 1. And what it means is that you use a very little uh, uh, material, thermoelectric materials. And uh, that way you generate uh, uh, about 200 degree temperature, uh, cell, uh, uh, temperature difference without uh, any optical concentration system, and you can uh, achieve a, a respectable efficiency. So we continue on this, and uh, most recently, uh, so this one uh, is, uh, is only about 200 degree. We combine with the uh, concentration, and now we are around 9% uh, efficiency. And so this is all hand constructed, and the modeling say we, we should be able to achieve uh, uh, somewhere around uh, uh, 12 to 15 percent efficiency. So uh, of course, so this is a uh, uh, if you think about the current solar thermal, one is the steam. Uh, the the uh, uh, see the really the other way generate electricity is the photovoltaic. And now we, in from principal perspective, now we're doing a different way of converting solar into electricity is a solid state but it's uh, uh, with uh, uh, temperature uh, using the uh, heat uh, or spectrum. Let me, uh, uh, so this is, a, this is a wor what we're working on. Uh, on the fundamental side, that we need to continue to improve the materials, and this is uh, through the uh, then, uh, DOE Energy Frontier uh, Research Center, and uh, Marin is a part of this center. He'll tell more of the other effort we have. And, uh, let me give you one final example. Uh, this coming back to the steam generation, and uh, uh, it's not for the purpose of concentrated solar power, but for the dream of uh, I want to generate steam under normal sun condition, and uh, uh, for for many uh, different applications. So uh, this is a, this is the idea. Can I? Just let's say, for example, if I think about the uh, desalination, can I just deploy this on the ocean surface, on the base surface? And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, if we think about the key is how I can concentrate the solar energy to generate hot spot. And here, uh, what we have is a floating uh, absorber. This is, in this case, is a porous absorber on the uh, water surface. And you basically concentrate all the sunlight in this parse media that uh, uh, it generate locally hot region, and you suck in the uh, water, and that generates steam. And uh, so we, we had the first demonstration, and now we can do this just under low more sun condition and uh, with, uh, with the gear towards the uh, water uh, treatment and desalination uh, applications. So I just want to give a few examples to show the uh, activity. You'll, you'll hear more uh, at MIT, and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gong. Um, so one brief question. Uh, you, you talked about the aerogels as, as a way to reduce the, the radiation losses from receiver tubes in a linear Fresnel system. Um, do, do you see an opportunity for those also in the central receiver systems that Alex was describing? So one, one of the big problems there is the thermal stress going uh, day to night or, or even 
during the day fluctuations in solar radiation on the, the heat exchanger tubes at, at the top, uh, producing very rapid thermal uh, cycling. Uh, can these aerogels withstand those temperatures, uh, those energy fluxes? Um, how durable are they? Well, this, uh, this uh, aerogels, those aerogels are basically uh, silicon dioxide uh, is glass and uh, it can't go to too high temperatures. Mm -hmm. um, and the sweet spot we, we feel is uh, actually in a concentration not as high as the central uh, concentration system where you go to a thousand degree, a thousand concentration ratio. Uh, we're working on more like a 30, 40 concentration ratio. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, that, in that case, the radiation loss is important. When you got the thousand degree, the radiation relative importance uh, is reduced. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the, the next panelist is, uh, is Marin Soljicek. Uh, he's a professor of physics uh, at, at MIT. Uh, he's uh, won the TR35 award from Technology Review. He's uh, won a Mac MacArthur uh, Fellowship. Uh, he's a very innovative uh, researcher, Marin. Okay, thank you very much for introducing me and for inviting me here. <coughs> it says a laser pointer. Oh yeah, so anyway, this one confirms for, to Americans eye safety standards. I got this one in China, so I'm gonna use this one. <coughs> <coughs> so, uh, nanophotonics. So what we do in nanophotonics is, uh, nanophotonics is a subfield of nanotechnology that uh, deals with light. So in terms of applications, is lasers, solar cells, optical fibers, LEDs, and so on. What we do in nanophotonics is we create these artificially created materials which are structured at length scales substantially smaller than the wavelength of light. And when you try to propagate light into these materials, because it's so much smaller than the wavelength, light cannot really resolve the structure. It looks to light as if it's propagating uniform materials, but in which laws of physics have been dramatically modified compared to what they would be in the bulk. And by tailoring the nanostructure, we can tailor the laws of physics, well, at least as far as light is concerned, almost at will. So this is an extremely powerful approach in that sense, uh, but uh, as you can imagine, what limits this to be uh, used and for which applications is determined by whether you have nanofabrication techniques which allow you to do this in a scalable manner, and especially for uh, energy applications, whether you can do it over large scales and whether you can do it uh, fairly cheaply. So then when you restrict yourselves to such nanofabrication mechanisms, the question is what are then the interesting things that you can do? And as I'll show you today, I believe there are actually many opportunities even for energy conversion. Uh, so here is an example of uh, something we did with interference lithography. So you can see that um, this thing has many billions and billions of these little holes here. Uh, this one is about centimeter size. We can do it wafer uh, scale or even bigger because it's done with interference lithography. So it's an example of a scalable uh, uh, nanofabrication technique. So the previous speakers went uh, over this uh, quite a bit, so I'll just go through it quickly. Uh, there are actually uh, many application opportunities for tailoring thermal radiation, and we can use nanophotonics for tailoring uh, thermal radi radiation. One of them is in uh, solar water heaters. So for this thing to be efficient, one of the things that you want to do is you want to absorb all light coming from the sun, which is you know invisible and a little bit towards near infrared. But uh, then this thing, as it heats up, especially as it goes to higher and higher temperatures, will start emitting light in infrared. That presents losses. So you really want to have this covered with a material which will absorb everything invisible and will reflect and hence not absorb and not emit in infrared. So we want to have this frequency selective absorber, basically. Then the other application is that uh, Professor Slocum uh, talked about it uh, also, but I just want to re-emphasize it these solar thermal systems where you concentrate light from the sun to heat this object up, and then you convert this heat into electricity in one many different ways. And uh, it, uh, actually these systems, solar thermal systems, have been going through a bit of a renaissance lately. Uh, I'll just make it slightly contr uh, controversial to make it a bit more uh, interesting discussion later. So as you know, we have all witnessed the great advances of conventional photovoltaics. Uh, so let me explain why these things are interesting, although right now they are substantially uh, more expensive than conventional photovoltaics. Uh, and uh, that is explained in this, uh, as I said, in this uh, very nice special report that came out in January in The Economist. The reason is like, for, for example, when you consider a country like Germany that has quite a lot of uh, solar PVs installed, on uh, 30th of May last year, that was apparently the uh, most sunny day in Germany at noon, 50% of German electricity came from photovoltaics. 
at that point, uh, the German grid couldn't handle all that. They actually had to pay France to take some electricity. Uh, so one could argue that, uh, well, you know, it doesn't make sense to build more photovoltaics until uh, for Germany until you figure out either how to store the energy or else how to transport it. Because, uh, but then when you consider even that particular day in Germany, only 12% of German electricity was generated by uh, solar because there was you know day and night. And uh, when you integrate it over the entire year, only 5% of German electricity is uh, generated by conventional photovoltaics. So that I illustrates very strongly the need uh, to have ability to store the energy or else transport it over long distances. These systems have inherent advantage that they can store energy. Even if you can store it for 12 or 24 hours, it's already hugely beneficial. So that means that if they could be uh, made somewhat cheaper, they would already be very important place for them in the grid, even if they are more expensive than conventional photovoltaics. I believe if they came down to price uh, of about two or three, they would again start becoming widely deployed. Now, to make a system like this uh, work more efficiently, one natural way of doing it is to operate it at higher efficiencies. And uh, at that point, what uh, you will still want to figure out is use this frequency selective absorber, which will absorb everything invisible and a bit in infrared. And then you don't want it to absorb, um, and hence you want it to reflect everything in uh, uh, further infrared because that will present losses. And uh, as I said, uh, it, it, one way to make it more efficient is to operate at higher temperatures. But uh, at uh, high temperatures, you're facing high, bigger and bigger mechanical stability problems. So uh, for one thing, your material choice becomes very limited. Uh, so what can you do about that? Well, there are materials for which, you know, something like even 1,000 uh, Celsius is low temperature, like tungsten and tantalum. So the natural thing is to uh, use some of them. And uh, that indeed helps dramatically. But nevertheless, if you just work, for example, with tantalum, uh, you heat it up, you cool it down, even after 24 hours, it completely lost its performance. You can see originally it had high absorption for low frequencies, low absorption for uh, long frequencies, but then just after 24 hours at high temperature, substantially deteriorated. Nevertheless, there are ways to handle this. One of them is, uh, for example, coating it with uh, 20 nanometer hafnia. And here, for example, in this case, even after heating it to 144 hours, it did not change much. Uh, so there's just one example uh, thereby uh, of, uh, of, of out of many actually that can work in this case. So the lesson I, I want you to take out of this is there are opportunities for, uh, many opportunities for nanophotonics for these applications, but uh, the biggest challenge here is not whether you can come up, design a structure that um, seems to be working for, uh, in your simulations or even for a day. The question is whether you can do it scalable and whether it can be, uh, and cheaply, and whether it can uh, be stable actually at high temperatures for long times. So uh, one of the things that we are working on as a, a part of uh, S3 Tech, which is the center led by Professor Gang Chen, is uh, we're investigating a slightly different uh, solar thermal uh, conversion scheme. In that case, what you do is you take uh, light from the sun, you concentrate it uh, to heat this object up. And now imagine if I can uh, tailor its emission so that it would emit at narrow band of frequencies right above the band gap of the photovoltaic here, this is a photovoltaic that absorbs in infrared, then it would be perfectly tailored for perfect conversion here, and uh, for, for perfect conversion of, of energy because it's uh, optimally designed for that. So you can think of this object here, a nanophotonic object here, as a frequency concentrator. It takes all the broad and uh, uh, energy that's coming from the sun in all wide range of wavelengths and uh, spits it out into exactly one frequency where it's optimal for conversion. So theoretical considerations tell you that such systems could be very efficient. Theoretical predictions are close to 80% efficiency, but of course in practice what will limit the efficiency will be practical considerations. So we are investigating as a part of, of S3 Tech how, what are the real limits uh, and the most the biggest stumbling blocks to achieving that. So here is something that we did recently. Uh, we built a prototype. The main motivation of building this prototype is so that uh, we could in parallel model it and uh, make sure that we understand all the important details of it. And then from the model predict, okay, what are the biggest roadblocks and what are the easiest uh, paths that we can take to improve, improve its efficiency. The first prototype was only 3% efficient, which was actually two times better than the previous such system. 
but the most important lesson that we learned from it is that simply by scaling it up, right now this is centimeter by centimeter, simply by scaling it up, uh, various surface to volume ratios work for you rapidly and uh, it should approach efficiencies close to 20%. So that's what we are working on. And uh, from then we can uh, work at other techniques to uh, build efficiency even higher, at which point it could be uh, potentially a candidate uh, for some kinds of solar, uh, so some types of solar thermal conversion. Now, uh, one other topic I would like to tell you about as an example of things that we do as a part of S3 Tech is uh, very broadly, when you, when you think about any beam of light, fundamentally it has three fundamental properties. It has uh, frequency or wavelength, right? You have red light, green light, blue light. It has polarization and it has angle of propagation. If I tell you those three things, I've completely described a given beam of light. And we have great material systems that allow us to discriminate light strongly based on uh, wavelength, right? You have red uh, filters, blue filters, green filters. So if you want to have red light go through, blue light go through, green light be reflected, I can easily do that with many nanophotonic techniques. I have, we have great material systems that allow us to discriminate light strongly based on polarization. So for example, I want to have one polarization go through, the other one being reflected, I can easily do this with polarizers. But we have much less material systems that will allow you to discriminate light strongly based on the angle of propagation. So if we want to have this angle being reflected, this angle being reflected, this angle go through, I have much less material systems at my disposal. And the fact that if you think of this as building blocks for controlling light, the fact that we lack one of the, these fundamental building blocks is indication that if we did have it, it should be potentially useful for many different applications. And that is indeed known to be the case. So let me illustrate it for solar thermal. That's the one where it's easier to understand. So in our case, we use sun to heat something up to pretty high temperatures, like 1,200 Celsius or so. So it starts glowing, right? And it, uh, this light that's emitting, is uh, presents losses. And even if we do perfect frequency uh, selective absorbers, this in at high temperatures will still present 20 or 30 percent of the loss. So this is pretty fundamental. But imagine if we did have uh, angularly selective material, uh, then in that case light coming from the sun will come straight through. When this starts going, only tiny portion of the light goes exactly back towards the sun. All the other light is captured. So this could enable perfect solar radiation capture. And we wrote a theoretical article in in 2011 when you realize this, that tells you that if you could do this very efficiently, uh, you could uh, have heat this thing up to 1,200 Celsius even without any solar concentration. And at that point, uh, economists wrote about this theoretical result also, but uh, did, we didn't know how to do it then. Now, so it, it could be useful for any kind of solar thermal conversion, thermoelectric, thermophotovoltaic, even mechanical. The higher the efficiency, the more, the higher the temperature of operation, the more useful it would be. For thin film photovoltaics, as you know, in single pass, you'll have just a little bit of absorption there. This enables, you know, nearly perfect solar radiation capture, so th it's useful there. And uh, actually, uh, recently it's been realized it's also in many conventional photovoltaics, especially direct bang up photovoltaics, uh, most of your losses are due to radiative recombination. And that actually exactly solves that problem also. That's explained in uh, works by Atwater Group. So let me show you something that we did. Uh, recently in order to address this problem. So remember, what we are trying to do is something that looks as a mirror. I tilt it, it looks as a mirror again. I tilt it, it looks as a mirror. And then one particular angle, it looks as a window. And then I tilt it again, it looks as a mirror again. So uh, here you can see our quote unquote mirror and reflection of our iPhone camera in it. We put the object behind. And now we're gonna rotate the mirror. It's gonna reflect various objects in the lab, especially this ruler that we put here. So you can see it acts as a mirror. Here it acts as a mirror, it still acts as a mirror, acts as a mirror, and then at one particular angle it's completely transparent, acts as a window. And then you tilt it again, and it acts as a mirror again. And uh, just the top view, so here is our sample. When we hit it just at the right angle, this is super continuum white light source. So uh, all the light goes through, right? There are no reflections here. When you hit it at the wrong angle, you can see 100% of light being reflected, right? There are no transmissions. So anyway, this is just an, if, uh, I showed you a few illustrations, a few examples that we are uh, working in this field of uh, trying to develop new physical principles, which then sometime 10, 20 years down the road can find uh, potential use in solar th uh, thermal conversion applications. So on that note, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Marin. I, I, I should tell the end of the story on the, the German uh, example you gave of, of paying France to take electricity during the day. Um, that night, they were buying nuclear power from France. So 
Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's the other, there's the dark side of that story, yeah, as it were, right? So. Germany versus France we were talking about, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so a quick question is uh, with, with your um, uh, absorbers, uh, these high temperature absorbers, uh, could you say something about the scalability of the materials that you've been looking at? Um, you talked about the so, sort of the loss in performance if you heat it up in ways that you could uh, coat and, and alleviate that, but it, do, you, do, you, do you find materials that can be used that way that are abundant enough to scale? Uh, right, yeah, so just those are some of the f questions that need to be answered, yeah. So one thing is uh, we believe that fabrication, we could scale it up either by uh, interference photography or actually in, uh, we recently published a paper that shows it with nano imprint. And then the question is, remains, okay, how much tungsten do you need? How much tantalum do you need? And recently we are exploring techniques how we could uh, use also uh, polycrystalline uh, materials like polycrystalline tantalum and so on, how you could uh, deposit it over... Uh, uh, so only two microns of it on uh, surfaces of other materials and uh, also uh, some materials that would be also oxygen resistant and so on. So there are many questions that remain to be, uh, uh, that remain to be answered to show that this actually will, is a feasible, is a feasible path. But we answered, you know, uh, we, we answered many of them, but there are many of them remaining, yeah. remaining, yes. Good, very interesting. Um, so the final panelist on, on, on the, uh, on this session is uh, Cliff Ho. Uh, uh, Dr. Ho is a distinguished member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories. Um, he works on a variety of problems there, uh, water treatment and distribution, uh, concentrated uh, solar power, heat and mass transfer processes, and forest media. He's going to talk today about the concentrated uh, solar power work. Cliff? Thanks, Bob. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cliff Ho. I work in the Concentrating Solar Technologies Group at Sandia National Labs. And I'd like to just give you a very brief overview of one of our projects on high temperature falling particle receivers for concentrating solar power applications. Uh, there are a number of uh, partners in this project. In addition to Sandia, we have Georgia Tech, Bucknell University, King Saud University, and the German Aerospace Center. Quick review of what concentrating solar power is. It's a large scale renewable energy technology uh, to generate electricity, again at a utility scale, and we use lots of mirrors. So you can see in this photo, uh, there's a large array of mirrors that are reflecting and concentrating the sunlight uh, to, in this configuration, a receiver up on top of a tower. And that receiver uh, is conventionally a lot of tubes. Uh, they're painted black to absorb the sunlight, and you've got a coolant running inside of them. Uh, it could be water for steam directly or molten salt, and you get that uh, fluid hot so that it can be stored. And you can store that hot fluid in large uh, insulated tanks, uh, and that's really the benefit of, of CSP, of concentrating solar power, is that we have the thermal storage, uh, as Alex has mentioned already. Once we have that stored heat, we can use that in a heat exchanger to uh, generate steam, to then feed uh, typically uh, a steam ranking cycle for electricity. So the power block's the same as a coal power plant, but rather than burning coal or natural gas uh, or using nuclear energy, we're just using concentrated sunlight. Now in this particular project, uh, I'll concentrate uh, on the receiver. Uh, we're looking at ways of increasing the efficiency and reducing cost in all of these components. Uh, DOE's sunshot target is to get down to six cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and one of the main areas that we're looking at again is the receiver uh, to enable uh, more efficient and higher temperature power cycles. So this is a three-year project, again called the High Temperature Falling Particle Receiver. We're in our third year of this project. And the concept is shown here. Uh, basically, we're using, rather than fluids in tubes to get hot, we're just dropping particles through the receiver. And we're illuminating the particles through that aperture with the field of mirrors or the heliostats. And once the particles are hot, they can be stored uh, in a large tank and then passed through a heat exchanger uh, imagine the particles slowly sifting through a serpentine uh, bundle of tubes where you have your working fluid. This could be uh, steam or it could be supercritical carbon dioxide. Once you have the particles uh, collected in the bottom, they're then recirculated back up to the top where the cycle repeats. So why use particles? Uh, what's wrong with the conventional uh, molten salt systems or direct steam? Well, you have the direct heating of the particles. 
so you can actually get to higher temperatures. Conventional molten nitrate salts are limited to about 600 degrees Celsius before they decompose. Uh, in theory, we can get these particles to well over 1,000 degrees Celsius. Uh, we can enable higher solar fluxes for increased receiver efficiency. Uh, we want a higher concentration ratio. We get basically a smaller footprint uh, and less heat loss. And without the tubes, which have limitations, you have thermal resistance to the heat transfer fluid. We're heating the particles directly. We can have very, very high concentration ratios, well over 1,000 suns. And of course, we can, once we have these particles heated, we can just store them directly uh, in large insulated tanks for reduced costs. Now, the particles we use uh, are commercially available. Uh, they're ceramic particles. They're called propens uh, from Carbo. I'll pass this around. And if you could just pass it maybe to the audience once it gets around. Uh, they're primarily composed of alumina. Uh, there's some silica. Uh, there's probably about 10% iron oxide. I think that's what gives it the, the nice dark color for solar absorptance. Uh, and ironically, they're, they're used commercially in the oil and gas industry uh, for hydraulic frac fracking. Uh, they're used to keep those fractures open, to prop them open. That's why they're called propens. So we're looking at a couple uh, different receiver designs for this falling particle receiver. Uh, this video here shows one, which is just simply a free-falling current design. Uh, we release it through a slot aperture, uh, and it really retains a nice uh, tight curtain or sheet of particles that get irradiated. Now one of the issues, of course, is as they're free-falling, it falls pretty fast, and we have a limited amount of residence time in the beam. So another design that we're considering is what I'm calling the pachinko design, pachinko or plinko board. Uh, you basically have obstructions in the way of the particles to increase uh, the residence time. And you can see the particles being released over these. These are stainless steel mesh chevrons. It's a staggered array of mesh chevrons, um, and the particles can flow over as well as through these mesh structures. If we take a close-up look, at how the particles flow uh, over and through these uh, mesh structures. You can see um, particles falling through the meshes. You can sort of see them bouncing around and along them. Uh, again, the pros of having an obstructed system like this in the receiver is that you increase your uh, residence time by reducing the particle velocity through the system, and you thereby can increase your heating and desired temperature. Uh, the cons, however, is that your mesh structures are potentially exposed to direct sunlight. If you have any pockets of regions where the particles aren't flowing, uh, you can really overheat uh, those structures that are in the direct concentrated sunlight. Now with regard to the velocity of the particles, we can use particle image velocimetry, which we did. Uh, we can determine the particle velocities, free fall versus this obstructed case. So in this plot, on the y-axis is the particle velocity, on the x-axis is the distance from the release. And the symbols up on top here, uh, are basically all for a free fall configuration of different slot apertures. They all basically fall along this black line, which is the analytical equation for free fall without drag. So as these particles are falling, they entrain the air. We really reduce any amount of drag. And as you can see, as you increase the distance with drop, you increase the velocity significantly. In contrast, if you look at the velocity flowing over these chevron mesh structures, it reaches a terminal velocity uh, almost immediately and it's nearly an order of magnitude less in drop velocity within a meter of drop length. So these uh, obstructed structures, this pachinko design seems to be doing a good job in terms of reducing the velocity. The big question is, how is the durability when it's exposed uh, on sun? So in this last year, uh, we've culminated our research into some on-sun tests. We have at Sandia the National Solar Thermal Test Facility, which is, uh, has a 200-foot tall tower surrounded by over 200 heliostats. Uh, we can provide five to six megawatts thermal uh, up on top of this tower. And we've created a prototype system shown here, uh, which looks similar to the conceptual drawing I showed earlier. Uh, we have a receiver through which the particles fall. We have a one meter by one meter aperture where the concentrated sunlight enters. The particles fall, get collected, and are lifted in through this particle elevator in this case, it's called an Olds elevator. It's a, an Archimedes-type principle. You have a screw, uh, and then you have a rotating casing, and by friction, the particles just uh, are pulled up along the flights of the screw, and we can vary the speed or the mass flow of the particles by rotating, uh, changing the speed of the rotation of the casing. 
The particles then fall down through the top hoppers, uh, and then the cycle repeats. In this case, it's just continuous recirculation to get the particles uh, as hot as we need to be. Uh, we do have space below for a particle heat exchanger uh, for testing. And next to the receiver here is a water-cooled flux target. This is how we know how much power and what the irradiance distribution is coming into the aperture. We put all the heliostats, we aim the light here first. We have a flux gauge, a Kendall radiometer in the middle. Uh, we take pictures of it and we can scale all the pixel values to that one irradiance measurement. Uh, this shows a cutaway of the top hopper and the receiver. Uh, again, we have this insert of the staggered array of mesh structures in there. We started testing with that first. Uh, and the particles will flow down through this uh, top hopper and then over that mesh structure. Uh, just some quick uh, pictures on the lift. We constructed this at the base of the tower. Uh, this is a, a very heavy system. It's about 15 tons. Uh, we have four large hydraulic jacks that have about a 12-inch throw. It takes about six to eight hours to just gradually lift this thing all the way up to the top of our 200-foot tower. Uh, this is a view from the top roof. It's lowered by a winch. Uh, and then the structure is lifted up through the top of the roof. Take a look at the top of the tower here. You can see the structure peaking its way up to the top. And there it is. And here's a view of the system up on top of the tower. This is uh, on the left, a back view. You can see that the elevator, this is square ducting is the elevator. The rest of the system is up here. Uh, all this white stuff is alumina insulation, uh, RSLE board. Uh, to prevent from damage from spillage. This is the aperture. Um, it's got a cover on it, and this is the water-cooled flux target on the left. A couple pictures of the on-sun tower testing. Again, we have 200 heliostats, but we can use any number of them. In this case, we have about 20 heliostats to produce about 300 suns. Our goal is to get up to 1,000 suns uh, for higher efficiency. You can see the beam on the receiver and a close-up of the uh, illuminated uh, mesh structures and the particles flowing inside of that aperture. And I have another video here. Uh, this case, we have 600 suns, we have about 40 heliostats. You'll see, whoops, the heliostats are currently aimed at a standby point here. They'll come on to target. You'll see it sweep across there. They're all commanded at the same time, depending on the location of the heliostats. It takes a few seconds for them to uh, slew over to the desired target. You can see them coalescing there. Now, this is just a close-up. You'll see the beams, again, coming from standby. And you'll see some indication here. It looks like a little bit of smoke. Uh, this is actually an issue. Um, the beams tend to be like a big bug zapper. Uh, but those uh, streamers of smoke have also been tied to uh, singeing of birds. And avian mortality is, is actually a big issue especially at some of the more recent power plants like Ivanpah, as well as the glare produced by these heliostats that are uh, not on the receiver but in standby. So both glare and avian issues are things that we also look at, uh, some unwanted side effects. And then finally, uh, this last slide shows again the particles. This is when it's uh, on, uh, on top of the tower. The particles are flowing down over this mesh structure. Uh, and down below, you'll see uh, the particles are flowing into five thermocouple funnels. We have five funnels. You see the particles here. They accumulate in them, and we have thermocouples in there to measure the temperatures uh, that of the particles. And I'm sweeping around here, and you can see here the standby heliostats. Fortunately, they're, they're in standby. Uh, nice view, but definitely not for someone who's afraid of heights. So in conclusion, uh, we've designed and constructed the first continuously recirculating on-sun high temperature particle receiver. We've achieved peak particle temperatures over 800 degrees Celsius. Uh, and the thermal efficiency at particle inlet temperatures of over 400 degrees Celsius range from 70 to 80 percent with a trend uh, going to higher thermal efficiencies uh, with higher irradiances or concentration ratios as we expected. Our goal is to hit uh, close to 90 percent. Uh, with higher uh, irradiances up to 1,000 suns. Our next steps are to perform on-sun tests with the free-falling curtain to compare against the other design with the Pachinko board. Uh, we've received a couple new DOE awards uh, to look at a particle, supercritical CO2 heat exchanger, uh, as well as some novel particle curtain designs. 
And I'll leave you with uh, this final slide to remind us that as we do research, not all things go according to plan, especially in testing. After a number of, of cycles, we did the, the mesh structure did fail. Um, wasn't unexpected. We got a lot of good data, um, but we, we take the good data, the bad data, the unexpected, and uh, we learn from it. Uh, we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cliff. Very interesting. Um, that, that picture brings up a question I had, which uh, actually relates to things that can go wrong. And, and the backstop you have, so what's behind the curtain and, and the mesh, uh, if you were to have, say, temporary blockages in the feed of the, of the particles, the particle film, then you'd have the concentrated beam going through. Right. Uh, and there's something behind that. How, how yeah, tolerant so, is that? So those mesh structures, those stainless steel meshes were simply adhered into slots. We, we machined in slots and they were put into, uh, it's an alumina board, it's a refractory alumina board. Um, and that can withstand uh, pretty high fluxes, uh, up to a thousand, but ideally you're right. If you had an obstruction and you didn't have the particles in front of it, you'd have direct irradiance of up to a thousand suns on that board, which would not be good. Um, it is an issue as it is just having flux on the mesh structures without any particle cooling as well as we saw. Um, basically, the, those meshes, they were oxidizing. You could see evidence of the oxidizing. They were getting dark. And with repeated cycles, they just got extremely brittle. It was just like wheat checks. And you could just break it up in your hands. And the part, as they fell, um, it blocked below it the flow. So those got overheated. And it was just a cascading effect. It's like a Salvador Dali painting. Um, and without the, without the structure, so ideally, I'd like to just put the flux directly on the particles, not worry about any type of need for a pachinko board itself. And with that, you're right, you still have the potential for the flux to, to transmit through the particles um, and hit the back walls. Uh, but it is a diverging beam, so you have a lower concentration by the time it hits the back walls. And the material we use there, there again, RSLE board, it's good to well over, about, over a thousand suns. So we anticipate it should be able to withstand yeah, good. direct flux. Thank you. So I wanted to address a couple of questions to the, to the panel um, at, as a group. Um, and, and I'd like to start with, uh, to get your take on how far do you think we can get in concentrated solar power or sol solar thermal power uh, with today's technologies towards meeting scalable, cost-effective um, uh, solar energy uh, solutions? I, I found it interesting in, in, in hearing each of you talk. It's only reference to uh, linear receivers once, really. So we had the receiver tube uh, example, and, and yet that's the the standard deployment technology today for concentrated solar power troughs. I uh, saw a lot more of central receiver uh, design. So it, it, is that a reflection, pardon the term, that you, you think that we're leaving these linear receiver models and moving towards uh, uh, point focus models? Uh, what, what's the view of the group here? Uh, well, uh, from, yeah, commercially, you're right, the, the parabolic troughs are the most mature, they've been the most developed, um, and I think primarily because of their modularity. From, from a standpoint of efficiency, getting to the higher temperatures that we can get with the point focus is more advantageous uh, for higher efficiency, uh, getting to lower costs. Uh, certainly from a DOE perspective, I do believe the emphasis is now on more point focus or central receiver technologies. And your, your original question, you know, where can we get with our current technology? So I think the current state of the art would be central receiver, power tower, molten salt uh, systems. Uh, the, the levelized cost there, you know, a lot of range numbers, but I'm going to say 12 to 18 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, but as I believe um, one of the panelists said, you know, it's not necessarily just the absolute LCO, LCOE. It's the ability for load shifting, being able to provide that thermal storage to provide that, to offset that demand uh, in the hours that are needed in the evening. There's value, additional value there beyond the, just that LCOE. So I, I think with the conventional systems, uh, with CSP systems, molten salt, uh, power tires, uh, I think there's, there's value added. Others? Um. I, I tend to agree that physics is really annoying sometimes. If you can't get the temperature way up, don't bother. You're just putting a lot of hardware out there for 
maintenance people to love having jobs fixing it. You, you got to go hot, and uh, you got to go really hot for solar thermal ultimately to be useful. And that means the supercritical CO2 cycle has got to kick in. Um, I toured a number of linear systems, and uh, the dirty little secret in all these solar thermal systems is they burn gas, a lot of gas, to up the temperature. And if you, as a, as a plant manager type wearing my industrial hat, there's too much equipment not earning enough money compared to just having a good combined cycle gas plant. So we've got to go hot, and we've got to go with the uh, supercritical CO2, and then you can have a, a disruptive technology that will really change things. So whether it's the particle uh, or the, the molten salt, you also have to go direct absorber because too many tubes. So just remember the Incredibles, no caps, no tubes. Won't work with tubes. They leak. Uh, I, I, I would not say from any uh, uh, authority perspective, I, I always ask this question. I don't think I got a really clear answer uh, in terms of the, uh, the trough uh, versus the, the tower. My perception, I think I asked Cliff before, and uh, last time I was in San Diego, and my perception is the, uh, the tower system, the optical efficiency is lower uh, compared to the uh, linear system and the concentration side. So uh, the, the question that I've been always in my mind, I am not fully convinced, uh, is uh, uh, say now you gain in the, uh, uh, the engine efficiency and uh, you lose, lose in the optical efficiency, which one is better? So uh, I, I just raised that uh, because uh, I don't have a clear answer. But just to clarify that, I think the annual uh, efficiency of the CSP plants, whether it's a parabolic trough or uh, a power tower, they're on the order of about 15% annually, both. Um, so they're about the same right now. So let me, let me ask a variation on this, which is as, as we move to, to newer systems, uh, novel systems, um, how are we going to get from concept to deployment? Um, there's been a lot of uh, um, comment out of the CSP industry, companies that deploy these systems, that, that really what they need, uh, they say, is funding, uh, loan guarantees to, to underwrite, help them uh, to do first of a kind or for several uh, utility scale CSP plant. So I, Ivanpah, for example, it's a couple billion dollar uh, plant. It's an expensive experiment to do. Um, is, is that what we need to do, do you think? Or what, what do you see as the role of maybe pilot scale um, studies? So something on the order of five megawatts or, or, or so, or, or even lab scale experiments. So how, how can we use these cheaper, more affordable scale experiments to get from concept to uh, to confidence in a design to do deployment. Well, well let's, let's look at the, why is Ivanpah so big? Because steam, in order for steam turbines to be useful, they have to be big, hundreds of megawatts. But uh, the, I think there's the supercritical CO2 work that DOE sponsored has shown that you can get high efficiency on a five to 10 megawatt size machine. So I think we just need to skip the intermediary step of playing around with steam and say that long term, you got to be hot. You know, Carnot basically shows that for efficiency, you need to be hot. So we should not be focusing on things that are uh, just going to be steam, focus on hot things. And now you can build a, a utility scale plant for a small utility, five to 10 megawatts, so it's not such a big money. Because remember, the, over half the cost of that Ivanpah is the heliostats. So you're paying a huge amount of money for glass just to prove that the, the system works. Yeah, so uh, I would just like to add that uh, part of the motivation of uh, Esri Tech Center where we work on these solar thermoelectrics and solar thermovoltaics uh, is also that you could build systems that would be much smaller scale, right? Our system could be meters uh, squared and be as efficient as a scaled up system. So potentially they could be deployable uh, at places where, you know, mechanical systems, you know, as we just heard, they have to be much larger in order to be economic. Mm -hmm. and, and Bob, to your question, you know, what can be done uh, for the next generation of CSP? Um, 
know, I think the fundamental research, things that Marin is doing, is incredibly important. But I was really happy to see in, in that uh, in the executive summary I skimmed through on the, that publication, The Future of Solar Energy, uh, the emphasis or the recommendation to DOE for pilot scale systems, demonstration systems. I think one of the best things for CSP that was done by DOE was Solar One and Solar Two. These are pilot scale. Uh, mm -hmm. First one, Solar One was direct steam. Solar Two converted the receiver to molten salt. Uh, you ask industry, we had an industry day a, a couple months ago. Resounding, you know, that's one of the most, the best things you can do if you're gonna develop a new system or a new technology, pilot scale systems. My vision is to take our system that we have at, at Sandia and have a pilot scale demonstration of solar driven, supercritical CO2 closed loop power cycle. We've got funding to do a particle CO2 heat exchanger. Part of that has the, the flow system with the CO2. Doesn't currently, we don't currently plan to have turbo machinery, but you know, maybe we could get there, you know, on, on a, maybe one, maybe one megawatt scale. Uh, but I think a 10 megawatt pilot uh, studies are, are extremely important uh, for, for research and for industry. Good, thank you. So we just have a few more minutes, uh, but I want to be sure to at least have the opportunity for questions from the audience. Um, so again, there, there are mics here in the back. Yes. Um, this is a great panel. Um, there was discussion a lot on CSP. And, but if you really think about it, the real value is if you can actually harness the solar thermal part of it, right? For in, so I'm, I'm thinking more from an industrial application. So you talk about residential solar hot water heating and you talk about CSP, which is really large scale. But if you can get like 80%, so would anyone want to comment on solar thermal for industrial applications? Well, I mean, you could go, certainly if you skip the turbine, right, and just take the heat, there are examples in in uh, in practice today of of industries using the solar thermal uh, energy for steam uh, for enhanced oil recovery, for example. Uh, it's a way to avoid burning natural gas uh, for that. Um, so you do you do avoid that the biggest single energy efficiency uh, loss in the whole process. Cliff, you want? But I appreciate I appreciate that question. I, I agree. Um, and I'll just qualify it because I don't know if I haven't read the report. I don't know if the report covers any of that from an industrial perspective. Well, so so I, I think um, I, I agree. I mean, especially since CSP, you know, essentially we're competing with PV. And as the battery prices come down, you know, I, I've seen Tesla is buying batteries from Panasonic for $180 per kilowatt hour electric. Uh, if we lose that uh, marketability of storage, batteries. Um, I still believe that CSP and, and the configuration of the use of concentrating sunlight can still play a role in thermal. Process heat is about a third of all of our energy consumption. You know, I like to look at energy consumption in three areas. Electricity, which is about 30 to 40 percent. Transportation fuels, which is about a third. And then process heating is about another third. Manufacturing, drying, um, I think there's a potential there, and, and it is being addressed. There are studies out there, but I would love to see more, more interest and more application for CSP to the industrial thermal. I want to add a little bit here. Uh, I think it's more than uh, just the industrial thermal, and even just look at the household. Uh, currently, is mostly solar hot water, but you can do a lot more uh, from a, a storage perspective as well as uh, you can do solar uh, uh, air conditioning. And so there are indeed the, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, market uh, people, are, people are working on. I could say that the one of the challenges for all the technology, this solar particle thermal technology, uh, is really looking to uh, the, the market. Right? If, if you look at the, the solar thermal, in terms of electricity generation, that's a well-defined market. And when you think about heat, there's, uh, there's, uh, there are different plants using different, uh, say, different demand. So, so you got to have the right mar market sector uh, to be profitable getting into it. Okay. All right, so I'd like to thank all the panelists once again. Really interesting uh, presentations and discussion. Thank you very much. Good, so we're, we're gonna move now into the uh, special presentation, keynote uh, lecture by um, 
Dr. Ellen Williams. Uh, after that, uh, we will have a lunch that will be brought in um, at the end of that. Thank you all. Thank you.